Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike Brink from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to spend this time with us. We at Park Ave want to be of help to you, so if you have a prayer request or want to chat about today's sermon, fill out the connection card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks so much for being with us. We are starting into our new sermon series this week, uh, One Nation Under God, Because a King and a Kingdom is Better Than a Candidate. And we're going to be spending the four Sundays in September digging in a little bit to these areas. Now, you may find that, oh, Pastor Mike, I'm disappointed that was not nearly as controversial as I had hoped. I thought you were going to help put all the people who disagree with me in their place and align yourself firmly with my opinions. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I will likely continue to do so for the balance of the series. However, I think there's a lot for us to learn together and benefit from. Uh, I want to start here, uh, that we should be a thankful people, and I want to be a thankful pastor. Uh, we should be a thankful people. Uh, we live in an incredible nation, and we live in an incredible moment in history. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that we enjoy, uh, and it's easy for us to take it for granted because it's all we've ever known. Uh, I am thankful for those who serve our nation, be that military service or political service, especially over the course of this past year. Uh, our political leaders have been called upon to make decisions uh, in areas where they are not uh, well-versed. None of us are. And so I am thankful for those who serve our nation in a variety of ways. Um, I want to be a thankful pastor above and beyond us being a thankful people. And I am thankful for our freedom of speech and freedom of religion. There are many places around the world today uh, where a gathering like what we have is not possible. It would not be possible without great risk, without great sneakiness, and uh, there's a lot that we take for granted that we need to be thankful for. Um, I also want to hit on something else. may irritate some people right out of the gate, but that's okay. Uh, we need to remember that America is not the promised land. Uh, that's hard for us to take. We also need to keep in mind that Americans aren't God's favorite people. Uh, and often we end up behaving that way or thinking that way, even if we would never verbalize it. Uh, we think that somehow as Americans, we have a leg up in God's favor. And um, I don't believe that to be true. I do believe that God loves Americans. Uh, but I think he also loves Saudi Arabians and Nigerians and Mexicans and even Canadians. He loves all kinds of people. And his love knows no boundaries. It knows no borders. And we need to remember that. Well, today I want to look at a couple of areas. But before I even tell you kind of where we're headed, I want to dive right into some scripture. Uh, this is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning of verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Now, I love that verse, and it is a precious truth for us. Unfortunately, I think it's a precious truth that we sometimes can oversimplify. Uh, it is a theological truth. Uh, transformation that takes a while for it to percolate into our practical experience. And so sometimes I think we expect everything will instantly be different uh, the moment we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And there is a lot that changes very quickly. There are some things in terms of how God views us that change instantaneously. But there are a lot of things that are a process. And so we need to be patient and we need to be fully engaged in that process 
not just waiting for God to, well, God's got to do something. Well, you might have something you need to do as well in obedience to him. Uh, Verse 18, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Now, that, that beginning of that verse there gives us our first hints of a recurring theme that we're going to see uh, throughout the remainder of this passage and also a few other places we're going to be looking at. Verse 18 continues, and the next phrase is, and God has given us this task. So what we're about to read is really important But sometimes we've already made up our mind what task God has given us. And we've decided this is going to be my highest priority. And it can be a wide variety of things, not all of which are bad. They're just not his primary task for us. Uh, We may think God has given us this task to look morally good. Well, and looking morally good is not a bad thing. Uh, especially if we can remain humble about it, but it is not our primary objective. We can say God has given us this task to oppose injustice, and I believe that we should, but I believe it cannot overpower and overshadow our primary mission. We can say God has given us the task to be religiously active, and I don't think religious activity is a bad thing, but I think it can be, if we don't have our primary mission in mind. Uh, God has given us the task of dodging the big sins, uh, whatever you would define those to be. And I think that's a laudable goal, Uh, but it's not our primary goal. Uh, God has given us the task of talking the spiritual talk. And I hope that we do, but I hope that our spiritual walk matches up to our spiritual talk so that people don't see us saying one thing and living something completely different. That's called hypocrisy. It's hard to avoid, but it's never terribly attractive. And lastly, we could say God has given us the task of supporting conservative candidates. And I would say that may be something that you want to pursue, but as a Christ follower, it is not your primary task. So now that we've identified some things that Uh, that are not the primary task God has given us. Let's see what Paul had to say to the church at Corinth about what that actually is. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. That's our task. That's our mission, to reconcile people who are far from God to God. And why? Well, verse 19 tells us, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So what is job one for us as Christ followers? Our number one task is to reconcile people to God. Um, We do what he did. Verse 18 tells us what we are to do. Verse 19 models for us that this is exactly what God did in the person of Jesus Christ. So it's not like Jesus did one thing and now he's telling us to do something different. No, he's saying, you do exactly what I did while I was there. And I think we need to question as as people of faith, as people who are identified with churches and with religion, maybe with a specific denomination, do the words that we say and the actions we engage in, do they draw people closer to the God to whom we're supposed to be reconciling? Or do they repel them away? That's a serious question for us to grapple with. Let's continue to verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. We're going to come back to that idea in just a moment. It's going to be really the major thrust of our message this morning. So we are Christ's ambassadors. 
God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's powerful. We're going to unpack that idea of an ambassador a little bit. But that idea, God is making his appeal through us. The people in our world will make their primary judgments of what God is like by the way we behave, by the way we treat them. And we speak for Christ when we plead. And I go, do we as believers do a lot of pleading or do we do a lot of attacking? When we plead, come back to God. Uh, pleading is a position of uh, vulnerability. We don't like being vulnerable. And I think very often, rather than pleading with people to come back to God, uh, we attack them and say, get away from us. Uh, you're not welcome here. And that is something that needs to change. Verse 21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So what is the ultimate goal? Well, that people would be made right with God through Christ. That was made possible through what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. It was something you and I could not accomplish for ourselves. We were completely unable. As we talked about last week, we were dead. Uh, and dead people can't do a lot to see it to help themselves. So, big idea that I want us to grapple with this week is this. I am an American for now, and I am a heavenly ambassador for now. Now, in there, I want you to notice very key for us that we said, for now. I am an American for now. I will not be an American for all of eternity. Um, in the scope of human history, being able to be an American is actually a, a relatively new phenomena. Uh, we are living in a country that has uh, been in existence for about 250 years. Now, in terms of our lifetime, that seems long. In terms of human history, it's not. But I am an American for now, but that's not gonna be my forever identity. That will come to an end. Uh, America will come to an end. Earthly nations and nationalities will come to an end. That's not a forever identity. And I am a heavenly ambassador for now. And that is a temporary identity, uh, not in terms of us belonging to heaven, but in terms of us serving as ambassadors. That's a temporary role, something that we do for a short time. Uh, now, most of us, we've heard the term ambassador, but we may not be highly uh, familiar with what that actually means. Well, an ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat representing one government to another. And serving as an ambassador is both a great privilege and a huge responsibility. We can say, oh, that'd be so cool to be an ambassador. You get to travel all these places. Uh, and, and the prestige of, I, I'm an ambassador. But there's also a huge responsibility that is there. Because if relations with another nation are shaky, you may be the person that goes in and you're trying to smooth things over. And you're trying to smooth things over without compromising the values and objectives of the government that has sent you. Even if you disagree. Uh, you're not there to represent yourself. You're there to represent your nation. And so serving as ambassador is a privilege and a responsibility. That's true for people who serve in our governments. But it is all the more true for those of us who are heavenly ambassadors because we are followers of Jesus Christ. So we are Christ's ambassadors. That is a reality. 
You don't get to say, well, I want to be a Christ follower. I want to have salvation, but uh, I don't really want to have the responsibility of being an ambassador. Too bad. Package deal. This is what you get to be. I'd also like to invite you to read this second sentence with me. I think this is powerful for us to actually verbalize this. So even if you're sitting at home all by yourself, well, you don't have to be embarrassed. No one's going to hear you say it out loud. But I would ask you to. This second sentence, I am Christ's ambassador. One more time. I am Christ's ambassador. That's important for us to recognize that we have a role, we have an assignment, a non-optional duty that is given to us to follow through on. And I want to talk about two things about being an ambassador um, that make this so different and so unique. The first of those is, as an ambassador, I am chosen by God, not elected or appointed by men. Uh, we see some ideas here from Christ's teaching in John chapter 15. He starts out and he says this, you are my friends if you do what I command. Uh, that's the type of statement we can skate right past. But he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, I have given you some options, some expressions of obedience. And if you choose to be obedient, you are demonstrating that you are indeed my friend. We're working together. We're on the same team. But if you refuse obedience, don't claim that we're on good terms because you're not being obedient. Uh, we continue, verse 15. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, since I've told you everything the Father told me. Uh, Jesus didn't hold back. He didn't say, oh, well, Father God told me that, but I'm not allowed to tell you. No, he, he told them everything. Uh, he tried to go slowly and gradually and use small words so that the disciples could follow along. And honestly, they still missed it much of the time. But he said, you're my friend, so I will tell you. Then verse 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Why? So that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Now, there's a couple things there for us. First of all, you didn't choose me, I chose you. That's uncomfortable, it's humbling for us, but it's accurate. Uh, we can say things like, well, I accepted Jesus into my heart only because he decided that he was drawing your heart to respond. Um, secondly, I appoint you to go and produce lasting fruit. That fruit is marks of character, Christ-like character in our own lives, but it's also this mission of reconciliation that we've been given. And so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And we go, our eyes light up. And we go, oh, so as long as I use the name of Jesus, God will give me whatever I ask for. Well, um, God's not going to give you something to aid you in your self-destruction. So he's not going to give you something that he knows will harm you. He just won't. And also, this is in the context of being friends of God, pursuing the same agenda he has. So I believe these verses really talk about as we seek to reconcile people to himself, God wants to help remove obstacles, not create new ones for us. And then lastly, this is my command, love each other. It doesn't get much simpler to understand or much more difficult for us to live out successfully. He says, love each other. So 
Our second thing that we want to see that is true for us as ambassadors is this. As an ambassador, everything I do represents Jesus. My actions and my words do not just reflect on me. Now, this is a hard concept for us as Westerners because we're very individualistic. And we want to go, it's my life, it's my choice. What I do doesn't really affect anybody else, so it's really none of your business what I do because it's my life. And we really have to be able to go, my life doesn't belong to me. I didn't make it, so God owns me once, and I didn't have the uh, collateral to buy it back from the slave market of sin. God did, so he owns me twice. So my life belongs to him. And we need to humble ourselves and acknowledge that our actions and our words, they don't just reflect on how people think about us. They reflect on how people will think about Christ and how they will think about our God. Uh, in 1 Peter 2, uh, Peter did some teaching there that touches on these very ideas. Uh, verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I warn you, notice this, as temporary residents and foreigners. In other words, you're not going to be here for long. This is not where you ultimately belong. This is not home. So don't settle in too much and don't treat it like it's home. I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. We can get distracted by all the wrong things. Verse 12. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. So, practically speaking, what does this mean for us? Well, I can give you some ideas. You may not like them, but we're going to go there anyway. When I mess up, I will not be pr too proud to own it. I will not make excuses. I will apologize and own my poor behavior. So we need to be a people that are secure enough in who we are and secure enough in what Christ has done for us and are well aware that we will not get it perfect all the time, that when we mess up, we will just say, you know what, I was wrong there. I overreacted. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. I shouldn't have reacted that way. I was wrong, will you forgive me? Uh, that is a posture of humility. It is incredibly rare when it is genuine in our culture today, and it gets people's attention. One of the things that accomplishes for us is when we are humble people who can admit when we are wrong, we become more safe people to help bring about reconciliation because people will, are going to feel more safe with us because we're willing to be vulnerable. We don't have to be right all the time. Uh, the other statement that I included here, people aren't shocked that we fail, that everyone does that. I don't think anybody's looking at Christians really, not truly, and saying they should be get it right all the time. So people aren't shocked when we fail, but they are confused when we take a posture of arrogance and refuse to admit when we're wrong. I think people are willing to allow us space to be human, to be wrong, if we own it, and we'll just say, I was wrong there. In Matthew 5, Jesus did some additional teaching. He said this about our identity, about our function in this world. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. 
No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And so he gives these two common examples that those listeners especially would have connected with. Salt, which is a flavoring but was also a preservative, and light that illuminates dark places. Uh, while it may not work exactly the same for us in terms of lamps and lampstands, we understand principles of illumination. And then he goes on, verse 16. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise you for how good you are. No. And sometimes that's what we act like our good deeds are for, is to make everyone look at us and go, oh, wow, he's so amazing. She's so just upright and, and righteous. That's not the purpose. So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. When we shine bright, it points to a source of illumination that is greater than us. Uh, anybody who knows us much at all knows that our bulbs ain't that bright. And so when that kind of light comes forth from us, they know it's a God thing. Now, this will not be a shock to anyone that America is in a season of upheaval. Uh, we can get scared, we can get overwhelmed, Unfortunately, we can also get very arrogant. Uh, what I want to challenge us with is this. And we, we know this on a head level, but we need to get it to a heart level. That no matter who is in the White House, it won't change who is on the throne. Uh, whoever is our next president, they're not in charge. God is. We can trust him. Now, we bear some responsibility, certainly. Let me go back to our ambassadorship. As ambassadors, with a steadfast hope for the future, which we do have, we don't have to be running around in a panic about what's going to happen next because we know who ultimately is in control and we know who ultimately wins. So we have a steadfast hope for the future. We need to be a people who compassionately speak out while others freak out. We don't need to be people who add to the panic. We have no reason. Now, do we have reason to humanly be concerned about some things? Yes. And I don't think we need to be fake about that. But big picture... We have a security that they cannot imagine. So we need to be people who speak out with compassion rather than just joining all the noise of people panicking and freaking out. We need to be different. Now, some of you have a concern and you say, what if the church comes under greater persecution? What if Christians come under greater persecution? And some of you We've lived enough life that we can go, I remember the way things used to be, and I see the way things are now, and it doesn't seem to be trending in a positive direction. Well, I have a couple of thoughts for you. If, what, about if, what if greater persecution happens? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, three things. One, then God knew what he was talking about when he told us, Life would be hard, that persecution would come. If it actually does, then we know, wow, God knew what he was talking about. That makes him more worthy of our trust. Secondly, if, if the church comes under greater persecution, then we'll need each other more, and the church will get stronger. Because if it costs you something to identify yourself with Christ, People who are kind of riding the fence, kind of half in, half out, uh, they're going to go all the way out. And the people who stay are going to be the people that are like, I'm scared. 
But if, if God calls me to suffer, I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to take a stand. And when those kind of people band together, there's an incredible strength there. And the church may not be more numerous, but it will be stronger because those who are here will be here because they mean it and because they've counted the cost. Third, if the church comes under greater persecution, then the light will shine brighter as this world gets darker. It's just the nature of things. That as our world gets darker, there will be a greater need for sources of hope, for something that is bigger, for something that makes sense, for something that transcends all of this. And church, in the person of Jesus Christ, we have that light to offer. That's a powerful thing for us. Um, just a reminder, and I, I try to dodge these cutesy sayings as much as I can, but sometimes it, it's just right. It's, it's the right way to express something. We need to remember that we don't go to church. We are the church. Hopefully, a season of quarantine and of not being able to come and gather together served as a reminder. We did not stop being the church during that season. We just stopped being able to gather together at a physical location. I'm thankful that we're back, uh, but I am also trusting God for whatever we experience going forward, that he will not be surprised, he will not be ambushed. He is good and he will guide. I had two more verses I wanted us to look at together. These are from John 13. Again, Jesus is speaking here. And he says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's how they're going to know what we're really about. How we treat one another, and then in, term, in time, how we treat other people. How we help bring about reconciliation. And I can't help reconcile someone that I'm being antagonistic to, or that I'm trying to pretend they don't exist. I can't do it. So I would suggest this to all of us. How I embody his love matters more than how I cast my vote. Now, I'm not saying that voting doesn't matter. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't vote. Actually, I think you should. What I'm saying is here is that your vote impacts a finite system for a moment in time. But when you embody his love, you have the opportunity to impact eternity. So we can't let lesser things overshadow the more important things. I'd like to close with a statement. Uh, I'd like to challenge us to read this together uh, and then we'll close. My statement is this, I will choose to live my life on mission for God as a Christ empowered ambassador, reconciling people who fear to the God who loves. Reconciling people who fear, people who are afraid, to the God who loves them. Our lives need to speak that loud and clear. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, God, I thank you that you are at work, even in the midst of all the chaos going on around us, all the questions. God, I, I believe that sometimes you allow a degree of unsettledness because it reminds us how little we can really control and how much we need you. God, I pray that today you would challenge each one of us with our role as ambassadors, uh, that we would not become so intoxicated with that title or with that privilege that we lose sight of the responsibility that we have. God, help us to be reconcilers bringing people who are far from you closer to home. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us. I hope you have a great week. 
and they reflect on what we're learning together.